First of all, thank Ilya for inviting us to participate in this event and for organizing. Um, I'm just going to give a brief introduction to our team and then I'm going to pass it off to my colleagues who, are, who have been doing most of the work and they're going to um, talk about their intro, individual contributions. But I'm Elizabeth Colantoni. I'm a senior scientist in the Department of Biostatistics at the School of Public Health. And the other two team members here with me today were both originally students in statistical methods courses that I've taught at the School of Public Health. Um, and I also was subsequently a member of Jeff's uh, thesis committee. So Jeff Doherty, he is an associate in the epidemiology department. And one of Jeff's uh, major contributions from his the thesis work was developing a measure of structural racism um, that can be used in ecological studies of health disparities, um, which is he, he's gonna talk a little bit about that today. And then the second member today is Anisha Nagpal. Um, she's a, currently a medical student at University of Illinois in Chicago, um, but she took one of my courses last spring where her and a classmate approached me about developing a data analysis project um, around the emerging pandemic. Um, so they worked um, together to pull county level data from the Hopkins COVID tracking system and also measures of social vulnerability from the CDC in order to correlate information about you know, deaths and case numbers as a function of these social vulnerability measures. Um, and so then late over the summer, um, I reached out to both of them to pull us all together with this shared interest of um, disparities that we were seeing within um, the COVID uh, pandemic. So then I'm gonna let Jeff take over. Yeah, thanks Elizabeth. So um, uh, it's um, no surprise to anybody who's been reading the newspaper that um, there is a large gap between um, white and black um, mortality rates and, and also I believe incidence rates um, for, um, for, for the coronavirus. <clears throat> and our work here is um, really driven by the idea that while structural racism has received a lot of attention as a cause of health inequities, um, it's unclear what the source of the COVID disparities is at this point. Um, and that has been perhaps less carefully studied than the fact that the disparities exist. So our goal here is to evaluate the relationship um, between county level racial differences in COVID mortality and a newly published structural racism measure um, that Elizabeth and I and a couple of other co-authors uh, recently uh, published in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine. So if we can pop to the next slide. <clears throat> I think it's always good to get into um, kind of the, the, the baseline thinking on what we're looking at here. And so this is a conceptual model that informs a lot of the work on measuring structural racism. Um, I won't uh, belabor this uh, in, in the, the flash formats, uh, but essentially the idea is that structural racism is a fundamental cause um, of a lot of mediating factors that don't then go in to create um, health outcomes and uh, more appropriately differences in health outcomes um, for people across the gradient of, um, uh, of, of, of race categories. And, and so the basic idea here um, is that access to resources is really important. That can be housing, education, uh, healthcare, health insurance, um, the ability to stay home and um, not report to your job as an essential worker, things like that. And then that goes on to have another, uh, a bunch of other descendants that, that then lead to, um, to health. Critically also here um, is the idea that racialized group membership um, is uh, uh, an interactor with the presence of structural racism to create some of these outcomes, which is a little bit tough to show on a, a diagram like this. But the idea is um, that the effect of structural racism is differential for blacks and whites, which is not surprising because structural racism is a social system that is designed to channel resources to, um, to whites over blacks. Uh, so if uh, we can hit the next slide. Um, yeah, I think I, um, I've covered most of this. Um, we're specifying no uh, direct causal relationship between racialized group and health, which is really important if you go back to the idea of kind of the, the lack of a biological basis for race. Um, I think that's a, that's a key component. Um, and this framework is also interesting because um, it, shifts, it shifts focus to the upstream exposures that are maybe more modifiable than some others. Um, and it also gives you a, a good sense of um, where you might need to make adjustment to control for confounding. 
Um, I will also say that the idea of a fundamental cause is again key to this and um, is based on um, work by Bruce Link and Joe Phelan. And I would really encourage you to, to look at that stuff if you haven't, because I think it's, uh, um, it's critical in understanding how this works. So we can look at the next slide. So when we think about measuring structural racism, um, a lot of the work that's gone on in the past has been um, of, of the genre of um, let's uh, take a bunch of things that um, we think uh, are indicative or associated with racism um, and then regress uh, them as independent variables um, you know, uh, uh, with a, an outcome. Um, that we think might be sensitive to that, whether it's infant mortality or COVID or um, BMI in the case of our, AJ, our, of our AJ, AJPM paper. Um, the challenge with that approach, however, is, is that um, structural racism is really something um, that, that causes a lot of phenomena kind of across domains of, of, um, of social measurement. And so if you put all of those things in together, um, really, you're not getting the effect of, of structural racism. You're getting the effect of, for example, housing discrimination after controlling for all the other aspects of, social, of structural racism that you may have put into the model. And what we really want to measure um, and understand the effect of is the joint effect um, of the underlying um, variable structural racism um, and the work that it does through mediators to create health, health, health outcomes. And so the approach that I think is most amenable to doing that um, is something called a confirmatory factor analysis. And that's the basic idea here, which is that um, you have a, a positive latent variable, um, in our case, structural racism. Um, you have a couple of indicators of, of that variable um, that you believe are sensitive to changes of level in the variable. Um, and then you have cross correlations between these indicators. And um, basically, it divides um, these associations into a couple of categories. So um, one would be the degree of variance that is um, cross correlated because it shares a common cause that is your, um, your latent variable and, and the remainder of the variance which is uncorrelated um, is essentially left on the cutting room floor. Um, so this is a, a really good way of um, evaluating model construct extracting the variation in these indicators that is uh, plausibly related to your underlying model, um, accounting for measurement error by leaving the rest of that information, uh, as I said, on the cutting room floor. And then this also comes, as you'll see, with a really robust set of fit statistics so that you can um, investigate uh, the plausibility and appropriateness of your model. So that's what we did here. You can look at the next, uh, the next slide now. And so we evaluated 30 income, um, 30 incomes, 30 indicators, um, mostly using public sources of data like the census um, stuff from the Department of Education and so on and so forth. Um, and, and our paper describes a little bit more about the modeling process and kind of why uh, some indicators were discarded and others were not. Um, but this is uh, the final set that we, that we arrived at. Um, when we were doing this work, we specified um, five domains uh, that are relevant to, to structural racism criminal justice, education, employment, healthcare, and housing. And so it was um, comforting to us and exciting to us that we were able to identify a model that um, had at least one indicator in each of those domains. And we can look at the next slide. And so this is um, the, the final model that we arrived at. Um, and you can see that um, housing um, segregation and school segregation figure really prominently in this. Um, and then the other indicators in the other domains um, are, are less prominent, but um, all still statistically significant and, and you know, uh, oriented in the right direction and, and I think meaningful. Um, the stuff on the left, um, if, you're, if you're not up on this methodology, um, basically uh, this tells you that this is a, a pretty good fitting model, um, and which, which uh, also um, you know, was, uh, was reassuring to us as we move forward. So next slide. And so this is one result of the model, which is just looking at um, variation and structural racism across US counties. Um, one thing that I think it's important to note and that will figure um, prominently in um, some of the, the work on COVID disparities um, is the fact that we did not calculate a county structural racism score um, for counties that had less than 500 black people. Um, and that's uh, in, keep, in keeping with other literature that does things um, of this ilk and also just conceptually with the idea that 
um, it's can be very difficult to uh, for a, a county to kind of um, develop the sorts of institutional discrimination um, machinery that um, is inculcated in structural racism if there's a very small black population. It also makes it very difficult to measure reliably. Um, so, so that's that's why you see uh, kind of in the middle of the country um, and up towards the north uh, a fairly a fairly large information gap. So, um, next slide. Yeah, so that's it for my piece, and um, I will turn it over at this point. So we began by collecting county level uh, COVID-19 death counts from the CDC. And so um, they basically had uh, data tabulated by race and Hispanic origin, but only for counties with more than 100 deaths reported. So when we first started, um, there was only 295 counties represented, but then as of December 23rd, there were 461 counties uh, represented as deaths and cases have increased. And then um, to increase our sample size, we started looking at state health department websites to uh, retrieve more county level data. and. Um, we had some difficulty with this because a lot of uh, state state health department websites wouldn't necessarily tabulate cases or deaths by uh, race and Hispanic origin or ethnicity. Um, so we looked at Florida, Indiana, Mississippi, Virginia, and Wisconsin and got 183 additional counties. Um, and then for additional demographic information, we looked at the American Community Survey from the U.S. Census. So the analysis plan, um, so, so far with descriptive analysis, we compared counties with stru the structural racism measure. So those counties that had the measure um, and had populations of black residents greater than 500, and then counties with available COVID-19 mortality information, and then calculated relative and absolute COVID-19 mortality rates. And um, as uh, non-Hispanic blacks to non-Hispanic whites, and then looked at the relationship between that and structural racism. And for a confirmatory analysis, um, we're creating meta-analysis regression models to look at the association between the relative rates and absolute differences with uh, structural racism. So here's just a plot that sort of shows our sample size um, accumulated with the CDC um, data, as well as extra counties that we were able to uh, get from state health departments. Um, so that gave us a sample size of 586, and that's in the blue. And then in the green um, is basically the distribution of counties and their structural racism score um, from all of the counties with a structural racism score. Um, and if you look in the next slide, um, this is again, just comparing those distributions between what we were able to accumulate with uh, the avail available COVID-19 mortality information um, tabulated by race and ethnicity um, to what was available with the structural racism score. And for the most part, um, the distributions are pretty similar. Um, as you can see in the bottom right for percent rural, there is a, a a large number of counties with the structural racism score that were uh, considered rural um, that weren't included in the CDC data or any of the state health department data that, that we were able to find. Um, and that's probably due to the CDC only including um, counties with uh, cases that have, or with um, counties that have had only like 100 deaths. And so um, again, like our limitations were uh, just limited data from the CDC and then also limited data from state department websites. We went to several different state department um, websites and were unable to necessarily always find data at the county level by race and ethnicity. Um, so that was definitely um, a barrier trying to find all of that data. And that's where we are. We are currently. Yeah, we're just like a big work in progress. Great. That's excellent. Thank you very much for your presentation. As I said, uh, please let's hold all the questions uh, until uh, the end. And uh, I believe our next speaker is uh, Natalie Flaxmanov. Uh, 